So we are honored and pleased to have the Honorable Paul Hellyer, former Canadian Minister of National Defence and founder of the Canadian Action Party, dedicated to Canadian monetary reform. He will present Canada's strong history of public banking, what it did for the country in its heyday, and how it got suppressed by private interests. <laughs> Honorable Hellyer. Well, thank you very much for uh, the introduction. We're delighted to be here. I'd like to thank Ellen for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to exchange a few ideas with you. And the uh, subject she gave me was the Bank of Canada. So uh, I will try to stick as closely to the subject that uh, Ellen has prescribed as I, as I can. Early in the depression of the 1930s, uh, there was the same kind of unrest in Canada as there was in the United States. The banks were foreclosing on farms and houses, and the people were very upset with the banking system, and rightly so, and they wanted something done about it. So it often happens, almost always happens in Canada when there's a political hot potato like that, they set up a royal commission. And this is, uh, its purpose is really to take the uh, uh, problem off the front burner and put it on the back burner and if, maybe it'll go away, uh, but if it doesn't at least you get a year or two or three when you can uh, relax a little bit before the, uh, the pressure gets too, uh, too great again. So they set up a royal commission and the royal commission uh, recommended that we have a Bank of Canada. So it was originally established as a, a privately owned bank. The shares were $50 each, and they were fairly well uh, distributed. There was limited uh, ownership. Uh, but the, it's funny, the, the uh, Bankers Association pretty well ran things at that time, as they still do. And uh, they managed to get proxies from most of the ordinary uh, shareholders. Sure. Too loud? Just all scraping. Is that better? <clears throat> they managed to get proxies from the ordinary shareholders and elect the board of their choice. Well, more or less simultaneously, there was an election going on in Canada in 1935, and the Liberal leader, uh, William Lyon Mackenzie King, uh, was running on a platform of nationalizing the Bank of Canada. And he really got the idea from Jerry DeGear that uh, Victoria was telling you about earlier, and I don't know if Ellen mentioned him or not, but he was one of the earliest and most effective of Canadian uh, monetary reformers. So the Liberals won the election, and three years later, in 19... Uh, I guess it was 1938, the government of Canada bought all of the outstanding shares of the bank and registered them in the name of the Minister of Finance, which is comparable to your Secretary of the Treasury here in the United States. All of the privately owned banks, the big banks, opposed this measure, except one, the Royal Bank of Canada, so it isn't too surprising that the first governor of the bank was a uh, high official from the Royal Bank of Canada. His name was Graham Towers. And he was, in my opinion, um, the best of the governors that we have ever had and, uh, and really did a first class job uh, overall. So perhaps because he was new on the beat, he didn't do very much from 1935 until 1938, but in 1939, when the war came along, the Bank of Canada sprung to action. 
They created very significant amounts of money for the government of Canada, and at near zero cost. And the way the system worked was this. The government of Canada sold bonds to the bank for cash. The bank printed, P-R-I-N-T-E-D, the money to buy the bonds. The government of Canada paid interest on those bonds. It was a low rate of interest, but they paid interest on the bonds. And then at the end of the year, the Bank of Canada, because by then it was publicly owned, gave the interest back as dividends. So that the net cost of the money to, was near zero, just the cost of administration deducted. This provided with the government of Canada with a very large uh, cash flow at near zero cost. Well, the government of Canada, of course, spent the money into circulation, and it was what they call high-powered money. And it then became the kind of money that the private banks used to expand their lending base so that they could uh, help finance the uh, factories needed for war munitions and uh, to lend to people to buy war bonds and to do all of the other things that had to be done. Well, this system worked absolutely beautifully. And uh, in 19, the, the results were really quite incredible. In 1938, there were no jobs in Canada, none. And it wasn't long after the war broke out until everyone was working, either in industry or in the armed forces. And we reached an historic low unemployment rate of about 1%. Haven't come close to it for a long time. But are actually the Employment jumped from about 4 million to 5 million in just a matter of a year or so. Very fast recovery. Well, the post-war, uh, during that period of time, of course, we mobilized. And we had a Commonwealth Air Training Plan where we uh, trained pilots from New Zealand and Australia. We had some from Norway. And we built up the fourth uh, largest navy in the world, starting virtually from scratch. Then we maintained the same system after the war, and Ellen has already given you the list of some of the uh, better achievements, and there were many. So I'm not going to repeat them now, and besides, it'll save me a minute in case I have some questions later. But all went well, or reasonably well, until like the U.S., inflation started to increase in the late 60s. And then things began to go wrong. And we had, uh, as you did, inflation and stagflation. Gunnar Myrdal, the Swedish economist who coined the word uh, for um, stagflation, I interviewed him and asked him about it, and he said, yes, I'm responsible for the word. He said, but I don't know what it means. <laughs> well, <laughs> some of us thought we had figured out exactly more or less what was happening. Uh, there, there was a, a lot of, uh, maybe I'll come back to that later after. But what actually was happening was a lot of uh, increase in nominal wages and uh, prices, and the central bank had the invidious choice of financing the, the market, clearing the market at the higher uh, prices, in which case you have roaring inflation, or of refusing to, in which case you have massive unemployment. So in the event, they did what most people, I guess, would do. They compromised, and we had too much of both at the same time, and that's where the stagflation uh, moniker really came from. Someone who came up with an incorrect analysis was Milton Friedman. He was selling this, and I used to run into it when I was lecturing uh, 
various groups. This idea of 100 years in 100 countries that prices rose uh, in tandem with the increase in the money supply. Well, this was technically correct. But it wasn't the whole story. It's just like saying for in 100 years, in 100 com countries, summer followed winter. <laughs> and it doesn't tell you whether the summer was hot or cold or wet or dry, and whether they had huge crops or no crops. So you really have to go below the surface in some of these things, you know? And this is something that, uh, that Mr. Friedman, I don't think, did adequately. And if he had gone into it adequately, he would have found that during the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, nominal wages increased by a multiple of productivity, the average increase in output per person in the workforce, every year in a row for 25 years. This had never happened before in the economic history that I know of. And so it wasn't just or even primarily the Vietnamese War that was responsible for the increased inflation, nor was it primarily the blip in oil prices. It was primarily due to the fact that nominal wages were increasing faster, very much faster than physical output. And I think it was Joseph Stiglitz who said that of total cost, something of the order of 65% is either directly or indirectly attributable to wages. So you could easily see why the higher wages would be passed on in higher prices. And uh, this would account for the uh, inflation that we found so troublesome. Well, Friedman's single-minded approach and his irrational flip-flop from being a supporter of 100% cash reserves to zero cash reserves became the basis for the monetary counter-revolution. And I wrote him in October 1998 to ask him why he would go from one extreme to the other. I mean, 100% uh, cash reserve is 100% cash reserve. Zero, same thing at the other end of the spectrum. Why did he do it? He said he still preferred 100%, but that was politically impossible. So he went to the other extreme. And I asked him why, as I said, and he said to get government out of the banking business. Well, he must have been rolling in his grave in 2007 and 2008 when he saw the hundreds of billions of dollars that poor taxpayers had to fork over to bail out these banks that he wanted to be operating independent of government. There is really no such thing as banks operating independent of government. And as I will say later, perhaps the opposite is true at the present time. But this was the basis on which the the BIS uh, came to the conclusion there was a great opportunity to get rid of regulations and, and to open up the system, to have basically a deregulated kind of financial system. And uh, in 1974, they had had a small policy committee there. In 1974, they added a few members, and Canada was one of them. I guess we were probably flattered to be included with the big boys for a change. But uh, it was part of a new game, and that is when they decided, on behalf of the people of the world, to stop providing governments with low-cost money. And to say instead, governments are going to have to take their chance in the marketplace and pay the same high rates that any industry would pay or farmers or anyone else. Allegedly, they did this in the name of stabilization. They must have had their tongues away out their cheeks when they were saying that. 
because looking back, it has caused more instability than we have ever seen before. So instead of achieving its purpose, if that was its purpose, which I don't really think it was, I think it had something more to do with the quote that Ellen put up for you of the overall plan of the international financial community to take over control of the world financial system and with it, the governments of the world. And there's an excellent paper going around, if you haven't seen it, written by Michael Hudson. The conversion of Europe from social democracy to autocracy. I say excellent, it's a frightening picture. Get a copy if you haven't seen it. There's, I'm sure there are people here that could send it to you. And if the aim of the game, and this is the same one that, uh, that uh, David Rockefeller said to the Bilderbergers, that it's, the time has come when people are more receptive to the idea of an effective world government. And he said, of bankers and elites. And this is preferable to the old system. Well, it may be preferable for a few people, the 400 in the United States and a few in other parts of the world, but it sure isn't preferable for the masses. And I include all of us in that because I don't think any one of us is in the 400, are we? Hands up. <laughs> Not a single one. So we're all in the same boat together. Well, sadly, our Governor Gerald Bowie endorsed both monetarism and the new policy of having to borrow in the marketplace. Was this policy approved by our government? I think the answer is no. By then we had a man by the name of Pierre Trudeau as our prime minister, and I asked his biographer if there was anything in his papers which would indicate that the government had been consulted and had given their approval, and he said no, there was absolutely nothing that he had seen. I asked for permission to go through the papers for that period. I spent three days in the National Archives in Ottawa. Not a single word. Government not asked, no opinion, no agreement. Just a unilateral decision on the part of the Bank of Canada really starting this new trend of taking their orders offshore, as far as I'm concerned, from the Bankers Club. This was interesting because at a time when the big companies were moving in the direction of only being interested in their shareholders' interests. You know, earlier on, their individual entrepreneurs and so on would have some concern for the interests of the community or their, or their employees. And there were other interests than just the shareholders' interests. And they've all changed pretty well in the last few years, There's a few exceptions. But basically, uh, now it's, it's shareholders' interests above all. Our Bank of Canada went in the opposite direction. It had been very much working in our interests from 39 to 74, and all of a sudden said, whoops, we no longer care about our shareholders. We're just going to become a mother hen to the privately owned banks, which is in effect what they have been ever since. Well, at the same time that the Bank of Canada assumed the role of economic regulator, well, I should say at the same time, the Bank of Canada assumed the role of regulator of our inflation. And they gave us a mini recession in 1974-75, but that was just sort of a warm-up for what was to come. And uh, in 1981-82, as you know, uh, Mr. Paul Volcker, who was a, an ideologue, a dedicated Friedmanite, decided that he was going to put this, the system, this new magic cure, to the test. Uh, which he did, after a little tinkering, or tinkering around. And uh, he raised interest rates uh, 
in the United States, I think as high as 20% or 20.75% or something like that. In Canada, to outdo you, we went to 22%. And uh, I can tell you, it just wreaked havoc with our country. I'll never forget the pain of the hundreds of thousands of people who were put out of work, people off their farms after five or six generations on the farm, people losing their businesses that were just getting nicely started, and uh, social consequences that are impossible to measure. But then economic consequences. The economy slowed down, deficits grow, rolled over into debt, and then compounded it those incredibly high interest rates. As Ellen was pointing out the other day, at 20%, the debt doubles in four years. And that's where the problem comes from. During that recession, incidentally, one arm, or allegedly one arm of the Canadian government, the Bank of Canada, was putting people out of business and creating unemployment in the hundreds of thousands while the government started 30 new programs to try and re-employ a few of them. Can you really understand anything more ridiculous than one arm of government putting hundreds of thousands of people out of work and another arm of government trying to re-employ a few thousand? I guess it's better than doing nothing would have better been better to avoid the problem in the first place. We were just beginning to recover from that when along comes a new governor of the Bank of Canada and uh, he gave it to us again in 1990. We thought we'd be real smart that time so we started our recession before you got yours going. <laughs> but um, you know if you have to win a race I'm not sure that that's the kind of race you want to win. And uh, ours lasted longer, too. And one of our best economists at the University of Montreal called it the Great Canadian Slump. Well, it sure caused a, a slump in our welfare, I can tell you that. Crow was so dedicated to the idea of inflation control that he wanted to change the Bank of Canada Act to say that inflation control was the one and only responsibility of the central bank. Fortunately, people from all political parties united and came together and stopped it. Thank goodness. It hasn't helped us a lot, but at least the law still says that they should pay some attention to other considerations, including the general economic welfare of the country. Not long ago, uh, Ellen Brown uh, wrote something where she said that we had paid a trillion dollars in interest on the debt, and she mentioned that again today. And she's one of the nicest people, as well as being one of the brightest that I know. But I was still incredulous. Sorry, Ellen. So I had the Parliamentary Research Committee <laughs> check it out for me. And I said, how much interest have we paid on the federal government debt from 1974-75 to 2010? The answer came back, $1 trillion, $100 billion. <laughs> Here I say it, Ellen, you were being conservative. <laughs> Cautious is a nicer word. Well, one more strike against our country was in 1991 when the bankers lobbied the federal government to remove cash reserve requirements altogether. And so they did the usual things, you know, the lobbying and all that sort of stuff. And to his credit, the Minister of Finance wrote the governor of the Bank of Canada and said, would you still be able to control the rate of increase in the money supply? And Bowie said, yes, by other means. 
Presumably he was thinking about uh, something comparable to the open market uh, operations of the Fed. Well, we took them off over a four-year period. That proved that Milton Friedman was right about one thing. That was that it would be more politically possible to get zero reserves that it would have 100% reserves. It was, in effect, though, the point of transition from a cash reserve system, where theoretically, at least, governments have some control to a capital adequacy system. It should be capital inadequacy system, over which governments have no control. Because and. You can see it going on now today. I overheard someone saying the BIS was going to squeeze the small banks with the capital requirement. And they can squeeze the small ones that don't have the, the opportunity. The big ones have enough offshore money. If they need an extra $100 billion, they can just bring it in from one of the islands somewhere, or one of the American states, actually, and plunk it in, and they're OK. Well, the little banks go under, and they squeeze the power and uh, consolidate their empires, which they did during the 1930s, and which they're always wanting to do in one way or another. Well, in the latest meltdown, it was rumored that Canadian banks did better than the US banks, that we didn't need to bail ours out. Well, that is not true. Our government and the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, in two operations bought about $75 billion in mortgages or mortgage packages. And according to Bloomberg, would have gone to $120 billion. So if you take that 10 times for the US, you know you're talking about over a trillion dollars in assets. and. Uh, managed to get away with a public relations campaign. Our national broadcasting system in one day said five times that the Canadian bankers didn't need to be bailed out. Just, and I'm sure it wasn't deliberate, they just didn't know, no one was telling them, they weren't paying any attention, and so the average Canadian thinks that they weren't bailed out, but that is not correct. The Bank of Canada never admitted how much it created to facilitate these transactions, but if you look at its, its uh, annual report, you'll see that there was a blip in assets. And uh, so obviously they did create a considerable amount of money. Well, actually, the Bank of Canada itself is not public banking in the sense that is being promoted here today. But it did spawn a bank that does fit the public banking mold. It began as a wholly owned a subsidiary of the Bank of Canada in 1944. and was called the Industrial Development Bank. It has gone through various permutations and combinations since then and three or four name changes. It is now called the Business Development Bank of Canada. It is 100% owned by the Government of Canada and it engages in high-risk loans to businesses who don't have the capital or the credentials to borrow from the uh, privately owned banks. It seems very secure in its role. It's, do it's done a great job. So what of the future? Well, there's no sign of relief. We have a very orthodox conservative government some of us have been trying to change its austerity budget and use the Bank of Canada to get the country up and running. Not only for our sake, but to light up a light lamp for the world. We've launched a campaign. We asked the government of Canada to withdraw its budget. It's not passed yet. It still has to be approved by the House of Commons and then by the Senate, to withdraw the budget, fix the money situation, and then bring in a new budget 
with the new circumstances, the new financial circumstances. And this is what some of us were asking the government to do. We wanted them to print 15 10 billion dollar share certificates in Canada. Non-transferable, non-convertible, non-redeemable. The same time to check the Justice Department to see if they were legal as collateral for the Bank of Canada to create money. And if not, to change the Bank of Canada Act. And thirdly, that step accomplished, the Bank of Canada forthwith to take the shares and deposit $150 billion in the bank accounts of the federal government on the understanding that it would be shared 50-50 with the provinces and territories on a per capita basis. And that the provinces who have the responsible for the responsibility for the municipalities would make sure that that was divvied up in such a way that they wouldn't be cutting back services so ridiculously as they are in my city of Toronto at the present time. The above might not be quite adequate to uh, end the slump totally, but more and lesser amounts could be created in the future years until the growth rate was up to at least 3.5%, maybe 4 minimum. Concurrently with that, that, the federal government must amend the Bank Act to reinstate cash reserves. said the Mulroney government in 1991 had taken them off. They have to be reinstated because there's no other way, even theoretically, that you can exercise federal control on the banks unless you have a legal requirement for cash reserves. And I'm proposing that enough money be created to get those cash reserves up to 34% in seven years or less. Now, what are the short and long-term objectives? The first and most urgent is to end the recession depression worldwide. I think about $10 trillion is required worldwide to start. Maybe in the United States, one and a half trillion off the top of debt-free or interest-free money, depending on how it's done. And the second one is to put some semblance of morality back into the system. The worldwide financial system is nothing but one great big Ponzi scheme. It is a total fraud. Under the current system in Canada, the law says that our banks can lend the same money to 20 different people and collect interest from each one of them. Now, wouldn't you like to be able to do that? You'd be in jail in four days. But somehow, over the years, they have managed to persuade, and I'll use that nice word, politicians to grant them legislation which protects them from what would happen to them otherwise if they were doing the same thing. And it's one thing to have a low multiple, like two to one, which was the case when the Bank of England was first formed, it's something else to have 10 to 1, 15 to 1, 20 to 1, cases even higher than that. It is just total fraud. That's all it is. And it has got to stop. So I am proposing a reduction in the bank leverage from 20, the present high, taking our systems, 20 to 1, uh, to 
situation where banks would not be allowed to have interest-bearing assets greater than two times their cash reserves in their vaults or on deposit with the central bank. And that the governments in the process would have two objectives, one to get their economies up and running at a stable rate, a sustainable rate, and then at the same time during that seven year period, buy back up about a third of their outstanding debt, get it off the books. Once banks have achieved 34% cash reserves, money to the division I'm proposing would be that 34% of the new money would be created by the federal government who incidentally owns the right, has the sovereignty to print money. Banks do not. They have no rights whatsoever. All they have are privileges that have been granted by legislatures. So the federal governments would, uh, would create 34% of the money and the private banks would create uh, 66%. But the biggest achievement of the whole process would be the democratization of the so-called democracies. At the present time, there is not one real democracy in the Western world. Every single one has to trim their budgets and set their policies to meet the whims of the bankers and the bond dealers. And that is not right. Either we're going to have democracies or we're going to have a world autocracy with a small elite group running our lives for us and telling us what we can do and what we can't do. Why Canada first? Because it is the easiest. We own our bank outright, so we have a start over you. And also the law of Canada says that the Minister of Finance has the right to overrule the governor of the bank. So although they have not been paying any attention to the shareholders, the government has the right to say in future, we want you to put the shareholders first. And the next reason is that with a majority in both the Commons and the Senate, the Government of Canada could instigate this system, change the two acts required, the Bank of Canada Act and the Bank Act, and get the money in the bank, their banks, their accounts, in two weeks if they wanted to. No filibusters nothing to hold it up. So even if it took a month, it would still appear like a miracle. Well, what is at stake? The future of the world. The biggest problem in the world today is global warming. And I've got a couple of books out here, and one of them called Light at the End of the Tunnel, a survival plan for the human species. They say, I figure we've got 10 years to abandon fossil fuels and put in clean energy in every house, every airplane, every car, every truck in the whole world. And it is possible. The technology exists, and I mentioned that in my book too and where it comes from. But it's being kept secret by the same people who are managing our affairs by running the banking system and controlling the oil cartel. It's all hooked together. So we've got 10 years, years to do it, but today it isn't even on the front burner because nation states don't have any financial flexibility. To do what I was just talking about would require trillions of dollars. And the way the system is operated now, the banking cartel isn't going to let us do it. They put their own profits ahead of the future sustainability of the planet. Well, that's what's at stake. And my final thing is that uh, Victor Hugo said there's nothing as powerful as a, an idea whose time has arrived. I just hope and pray that now is the time. Thank you.
there time for one question? Anyone? I'd like to just add something that uh, you didn't mention. That is that um, there's a lawsuit underway in Canada against our government for not using our bank. Think about that, all you American lawyers out there. Uh, we're not used to suing everything that we disagree with. But this is something so important to every Canadian that we're doing it. And if you want to keep up to it, to what's happening, you'll have to contact a website that we've organized called occupyourbank.ca. Uh, yes, I'm just curious how you made the personal transition from defense minister to the, the positions you're taking now. Well, you, as a matter of fact, the transition went the other way. I went into politics on this issue. I'm a child of the Depression. There are very few here today. I can tell by the color of your hair whether you have any or not. And I saw poverty in its rawest form. And after spending a couple of years in the armed forces, I decided to go to university to get even with the prime minister for wasting my time. And uh, my economics professors couldn't answer the simple question why if recessions and depressions were necessary or not. They just said, well, read your economic history. Well, I can read economic history as well as anybody. And of course we've had them. We've had 25 in the United States since 1890 which is 25 too many. Not one of them was necessary. I figured this out and said, somebody's got to try and do something about it. There was going to be a depression in 1950. I got elected as a miracle in 1949. And then, of course, you find out when you get to Capitol Hill that you're just a little person and can't do anything. The Korean War came along. And the really bright people running the world find that they can print money to win a war when they can't print money for health care or housing or anything else that's important to the people. And so my transformation was really, I, I was lucky to be given the defense portfolio because it was one of the big four at the time, and I had no choice but to take it. But this has been my passion. Most of the people who know me would say my obsession. And I apologize for being so passionate today, but I feel that way. And I, I, I heard one or two references to the long haul. And you know what's going to happen to us all in the long haul. So I'm a young man in a hurry. And I want to see something done, and I want to see it done as soon as possible before it's too late. Thank you very much. Thank you.